Hi, and welcome to my three-part video series on a theory of consciousness. In this series, I want to present a very general theory or scheme that I believe takes a giant step towards explaining how the brain makes a conscious mind. I think a lot of us are baffled by consciousness. We'd like to know what it is and how it's possible that it arises from a physical brain. Perhaps more intimately, we'd like to know how our first-person mental self can possibly emerge or arise from nothing more than neurons and cells. That is, we know that if we look under the hood, all we see is meatware, neurons and glial cells, billions and billions of them, gray matter and white matter. And there's nothing anywhere in the brain that comes even remotely close to looking like a first-person mental self. And we'd like to have a glimmer of an idea of how you can possibly go from a neurological brain to a mental self. A lot of us are generally curious about consciousness, however others are very interested, trying to actually model and simulate the brain. I think some people are more on the right track than others, and I touch on this in a previous video about machine consciousness. But in general, this is how I see the problem today. When it comes to understanding how the brain makes a conscious mind, there's an explanatory chasm. On one side are the people who know a lot about how neurons work and how the brain is organized. Some of them are well-versed in programming digital computers. On the other side are philosophers, cognitive scientists, folk psychologists, and armchair psychonauts. In general, the explorers and bridge builders on the neural side seem to believe that if they can fully understand how a single neuron works, and then simulate that in a computer program, and then create a simulation that includes hundreds or thousands of these individual neural simulations, that consciousness will somehow necessarily emerge. And when it does, we'll be better able to tinker with it, study it, and eventually understand it. Personally, I think these efforts will eventually be useful, but the approach is short-sighted. It's like trying to understand how an automobile works by creating simulations of the hydrocarbon molecules found in the gas tank. In other words, these efforts are focused far too deeply into the nuts and bolts. These researchers and mind modelers need something some target that is less nuts and bolts and more conceptual, more architectural. Something that starts more generally with what thinking actually is or how the mind thinks. A target that is more centrally located in the chasm instead of mere inches away from the neural side. My goal in this video series is to establish a type of center point target in this explanatory chasm. A general model that starts with or accounts for the way we think we think and then tries to explain this in a cursory, general, neural, or connectivist scheme. Any eventual explanation of consciousness, or of how the brain makes a mind, needs to be able to address our first-person perspective. If it can't address the way it feels from the inside, or the way it feels to think as human beings, it's not going to be very convincing or successful. I've had a number of ideas about this for some time. I touch on some of them in my book, Evolving Towards the Truth but I'd like to present them in greater detail here. In this video series, I want to do three things. One, propose a mid-chasm scheme of how the brain makes a mind. Two, address and account for two fairly specific first-person mental activities that we all engage in. And three, describe it in a way that, in a very general sense, addresses a degree of neurological reality. The general intent will be to start the discussion on the psychological or the first-person side to start with a very general model of the way it seems to be a conscious being, and then incrementally modify this model to push it closer to the center of the chasm. So let's start with a very general, intentionally overly simplified sketch of what it feels like to be a conscious mental being. In essence, it feels like we exist between two rather distinct realms, the realm of external real-time activity and the realm of internal remembered imagery. On one hand, we deal with the external realities of objects, motion, people, animals, appliances, and real situations. And in the internal realm, we deal with thoughts, ideas, perceptions, dreams, and vague, inarticulable images. So, for example, imagine you're walking down a city street and you notice up ahead of you a ways, walking in the same direction, a person that looks familiar. In other words, something about the way this person is dressed, the way they look, or the way they walk conjures up a sense of familiarity or similarity with a person you know. On one hand, you're taking in information from the external realm and also experiencing information from your memories or the internal realm. 
This is the first common first-person mental phenomenon that I want to eventually address. I call this automatic memory stimulation. That is, you weren't planning on having a remembrance of any kind. It happened all by itself. You experienced something in the external realm that automatically triggered a vague image in the internal realm. Let's return to our example of the city street scene. Imagine that you continue walking and continue to be intrigued by this person ahead of you. Eventually, as you speed up your walk and get closer, you'll be able to determine if this actually is the person you're thinking of or isn't. That is, you'll perform a type of comparison between the imagery coming from out there against the images you'll be retrieving or experiencing internally. This is the second common first-person mental phenomenon that I want to address. We could call this process verifying or mental back-and-forthing. So these are the two mental processes or behaviors that we want to capture, or that any theory of consciousness needs to be able to account for. If we devise some explanation of consciousness that can't account for these two rather common activities, we probably won't think too highly of it. So let's now try to modify this general first-person-centric image of consciousness away from this extremely simple and conceptual sketch to something with a bit more neural reality. When we talk about experiencing mental imagery, whether external and real or internal and remembered, when we think of ourselves in our brains, we still tend to view our mental selves as being a type of entity or being that exists between these two realms. And to give it a basis of neurological reality, we tend to view it in this way. We know that we have bodies and various sensing systems. In this case, we'll limit them to vision, smell, and touch. And we know that somehow, when I touch things with my hands, I somehow feel or experience them inside my head. And when I smell things, somehow there's activity occurring in the olfactory area of my nasal passages that corresponds to this phenomenon. So we tend to devise another somewhat overly simplistic image of the self. In this one, we still have this idea of a self, and it now exists between these two screens of sensation, or qualia. When activity happens in the external, real realm, our sensing neurons convey activity up into our brains that essentially cause some type of activity to occur on this imagined screen, and then we experience it. Similarly, when we're remembering things, some type of imagery occurs on this memory screen, and we somehow experience it, whether it be memories of visual scenes, or music, or fragrances. However, we also realize there are some major problems with this image. For one thing, we know that all of this activity is occurring neurologically. There are no display screens. It isn't as if our eyes see sights and the brain converts this information to neurological activity and then magically reconverts it back to visual images that are seen by the eyes of the internal self. And perhaps even more disturbing is that this line of thinking leads to the dreaded infinite regress. That is, if the brain is nothing more than a front end that converts one kind of activity to another and then presents it to the internal self, well, we still need to have another brain inside of the self to make actual sense of all of this converted information, and another brain inside of that self, and so on and so on, ad infinitum. So this is where we are. We moved our diagram or our scheme slightly towards the center of the chasm but we really haven't gotten much further in trying to explain how the brain, nothing more than biological cells, actually becomes an aware, conscious being. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for in this first video. In the next video, I'm going to modify this scheme again in an attempt to move it even closer to the center of the explanatory chasm. We're going to get rid of the infinite regress and these qualia screens and address the first common mental process I mentioned earlier, automatic memory stimulation. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.